getting to be a favorite truth out of God's word for me, Isaiah 40, verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God has that for you. You may feel so weak right now, so weary and beat up from life and everything that's going on, but God has you and me together on assignment for this moment in time. And I believe the anointing of the living God, the truth of God is gonna connect with your heart, mind and vision and give you eyes to see what God has for you. He's gonna put hope where you feel hopeless. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for my dear friend right now, and I just pray that your word, Father, your Holy Spirit and your word will quicken them right now, where they're seated, standing, whatever they're doing, driving down the road. Father God, help them, quicken them, strengthen them. Get them ready to receive your promises and quicken the seed of that word in their heart that it grows up and brings forth lasting fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's so good to be together again. It's so good to be putting first God's word, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We're starting this new series called Why We Worship. Oh, I love answers and I know you do too. I like knowing the motive that we need to have for worshiping the living God. Listen to this. This is such an important topic for life. It truly is. Notice, I really want to major on the why, the why we worship and not get off into performance aspect of how. Motive is essential and too often in faith circles, we lean into performance, well, because it, it tends to evoke an emotional experience. I don't want to focus on emotions. They're too easily manipulated, aren't they? I want us to focus on outcomes, results. True biblically aligned worship actually triggers heavenly results here on earth. That should already have you so excited, ready, and tuned into this biblical focus. God loves you, and he wants you to have his answers even more than you want to have them. He loves you. God wants you to get kingdom results here on earth. He's glorified when you get heavenly results. Can somebody just hit the B3 button and let the choir get their jimity jammity dance on right now? Ah, <laughs> uh, It's good to have fun, and there's nothing wrong with getting a little bit excited. But God has made us emotional and it's part of our soul. But you were never meant to have your emotions drive the bus, so to speak. Unfortunately, too often, Christian experience has been polluted with emotional responses, soul choices, performance alters, and feelings, feelings, feelings. Not faith, but feelings. Nothing more than you know. And again, it's not that your feelings don't matter, but they do not produce the genuine kingdom outcomes that you so desperately need as the result of real faith and true worship. When I was a boy, I had this great aunt who she would repeatedly, when she would go to a church, she would say, hallelujah. There was always like this little lilt to the end, hallelujah. And then on the other side of the small country church, this other fellow would be always going like this, glory, glory, glory. And sometimes they'd kind of compete when the pastor would say something that was good. She'd be going, hallelujah. And he'd be glory, glory, glory. And it'd be going back and forth. And, and I would ask my grandmother, Nan, what in the world are they doing? Whisper, Nan, what are they doing? And she'd say, well, they're, they're worshiping God. <laughs> you know, when you're a kid, you want to know why. Why people do what they do. And let's face it, adults do some pretty unique things. And us kids, we want to know why. Now, if you're doing something that truly gets results, outcome, triggers, benefits, then no matter how weird it may seem, it persuades people, even children get persuaded because we like results. Everybody likes results. People want outcome. Romans 2, 4 says, it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. People want what we have if what we have is better than what they have. People who are searching for answers, the young, middle-aged, the older, are all asking, what's the bottom line here? What's the outcome when you worship God? 
There must be an answer and not just some religious platitude that insists on participation to ease your guilt. A little bit of penance here and there. No, that's not God's desire or his plan or his will for you and me. God doesn't tolerate fruitless rituals. Let me say it again. God does not tolerate fruitless, empty rituals. There is a definite answer to why we worship. That's why this is so important. You probably have been a part of a congregation singing in a church when we all join together in singing a hymn or what's called a spiritual song or even a psalm. For most Christians, that's their definition of worship. And yes, that's part of it, but it's kind of like it's kind of like holding a spark plug and saying, "Well, this is what makes your car run." It's it's a little misleading to say the least. There's so much more to a life of worship, so much more. So let's pursue the definition of biblical worship here. Did you know that you can sing spiritual songs, just the right hymns, and still not be truly worshiping God? Worship, true worship, can only come from true worshipers, and that's a matter of the heart, a posture of faith in God. That's right. Only true worshipers can genuinely worship. Anything else is just form, it's ritual, with no spiritual power. It could be emotional, intellectual, but it can't be real without a true worshiper. That's not me telling you this. Let's, let's listen to Jesus, what he said to the Samaritan woman when he met her at Jacob's well in John 4, verse 23. But a time is coming and is already here when the true worshipers, remember Jesus is talking, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit, from the heart, the inner self, and in truth. For the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. Amazing, isn't it? Jesus says God the Father is actually looking, searching for true worshipers. So there is a distinction between a worshiper and a true worshiper. The interesting thing here is the context. In this story from John 4, nobody's singing or playing guitar. There's no pipe organ or string section. The woman wasn't singing but drawing water from this deep well. Well, maybe she was whistling or singing, but we don't know. She was drawing water from this deep well. Jesus asked her for a drink of that water. And that started this whole conversation that led to a dialogue about worship. What do you think about that? Do you think giving Jesus, the Son of God, a drink of cool water to quench his thirst could maybe be counted as worship? Worshiping God? After all, what is real worship? Might it be an act of giving something of value that you have to God Almighty? Maybe even something intangible like your trust, your confidence, your attention, your faith? Jesus' interaction at the well tells us two specific things. Number one, if there are true worshipers, then there are also counterfeit worshipers, fake stuff, right? Anytime something valuable is identified, counterfeiters start their con game. And then number two, if God is seeking for these true worshipers, it must be pretty important and essential to the aspect of faith outcomes. After all, faith pleases God, and Jesus is telling us that Father God is searching for true worshipers. Oh, don't you want to be a true worshiper? I know I do. Let's dig into this deeper, my friend. I think we're on the right track in this study. Did you know that before Satan fell into sin that he was an archangel? His name was Lucifer and his portfolio, get this, was worship. What? Some scholars believe that he was over all the music in heaven. He was given the title of, listen to this, guardian cherub. Now remember that. The title guardian in partnership with the portfolio of being over all the worship of God. Ezekiel 28, starting at verse 14, talking about Lucifer. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. Verse 15, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. 
So as one of the top lead angels, one of his great responsibilities was to lead other angels in worship of God. But that anointing involved a ministry of covering, covering. Notice that shame is the opposite of covering. It's exposing. Lucifer was very beautiful and filled with wisdom, but then pride. He became filled with pride, and here's the thing about pride. It will destroy you no matter who you are. His fall was great and catastrophic. C.S. Lewis, you know, the famous theologian and writer said this, Satan, the leader or dictator of devils, is the opposite, not of God, but of Michael. He was referring to Michael, the archangel. And Mr. Lewis was right. Too many people think of Almighty God and the devil being on opposite sides of the spectrum with equal but opposite opposing force. Nothing could be further from the truth, my friend. If it wasn't for humanity being held hostage in sin, Jehovah God would have completely eliminated the devil long, long ago. God's working his rescue plan for us because he loves us. Let's read a little bit further now about this worship counterfeiter called the devil. Isaiah 14, starting at verse 11. Your pomp and magnificence have been brought down to Sheol, along with the music of your harps. The maggots which prey on the dead are spread out under you as a bed, and worms are your covering. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, light bringer, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the ground, you who have weakened the nations. Oh my goodness. From having a ministry or assignment to cover using worship, he is suddenly himself exposed as a traitor with maggots. What a great fall from being the most beautiful angel with great power to hanging out with maggots. But here's what I want to draw your attention to. When you've lost the power to do the real thing, you end up enslaved to a fake thing, working hard at a counterfeit version of existence. To fake it until you make it is a fool's errand. It's patterned after the great deceiver and fraud. It's not a life plan or a good plan. The late Edwin Lewis Cole, the founder of Christian Men's Network and a great teacher preacher, he said this, God is the creator. Satan is the counterfeiter. Satan is a worship counterfeiter. Now think about it for a moment. The thing every counterfeit strives to accomplish is to appear as real as possible. It's not real, but it fools people. Satan uses music, entertainment, money, stuff, all to get us to worship anything but God, anything but God. He even tried to bargain with Jesus, imagine that, in the wilderness to get Jesus to worship the devil. Talk about crazy. But remember, worship is only authentic when it's true worship. That's according to Jesus. You see, worship is not a style or a genre of music. It's not a radio format or a religious prelude. Psalm 100 verse 2 says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Singing to the Lord is actually spiritual protocol for coming into God's presence. Royalty and dignitaries, people of influence, all have requirements regarding protocol. So does God. He instructs us to come before His presence with singing. It's critical for you to know this because Your voice matters. It's important. God likes your voice. He really does. So let's dig into why we worship and allow me to give you a few biblical definitions for worship, okay? Here we go. Number one, worship is providing a context for God to show up and be himself. So the question is, when God is welcome to be himself, express himself, what does that look like? In your life, what outcome is expressed in your home? 2 Corinthians 3 verse 17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, emancipation from bondage, freedom. Outcome, outcome, outcome. It's dangerous to be content with and enjoy worship with no outcome. It becomes an exercise of futility that draws attention to the flesh but in the disguise of being spiritual, holy, sanctioned by God. And it's not. 
Remember, God utterly rejected Cain's sacrifice, and he was worshiping God. His sacrifice was classified as dirty, rotten, skunk worship. That's just me kind of editorializing there. Do you find that hard to believe? Well, let's look at Proverbs 15, verse 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination, hateful and exceedingly offensive to the Lord. In other words, it stinks. But here's what real, genuine, authentic worship of God produces as an outcome. True worship produces an atmosphere of spiritual access to a target area where God can manifest His glory. Now that is serious. That's amazing. That's a beautiful outcome. God's glory is miraculous. Here's another definition of worship based off of God's Word. Worship is an act of honor to God, which gives Him the right to manifest His identity and goodness in and to the worshiper. His name is exalted, and so His goodness is exalted. You see, God is able to do great where He's esteemed as great. God is given access to do good where He's esteemed as good. God's power to heal is manifest, whereas the healer, He's magnified. It's really so simple, it would take religion and deception to mess it all up. Worship works hand in glove with the simple law that says, what you magnify comes to you, and what you disrespect or diminish moves away from you. It has to do with your praise, your focus, your worship. One of my favorite worship stories in the Bible is in the book of 2 Chronicles, and it starts in chapter 20 at verse 1. After this, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and with them the Munites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. It was told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude has come against you from beyond the Dead Sea, from Edom, and behold, they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Engedi. Then Jehoshaphat feared, and he set himself determinedly as his vital need to seek the Lord. He proclaimed a fast in all of Judah, and Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord, yearning for him with all their desire. So basically, things aren't bad. They are terrible. Terrorists have surrounded the country of Judah and cut off the capital city of Jerusalem. It's a world war before there ever was even an official world war. So King Jehoshaphat, he calls for all of Judah and Jerusalem to humble themselves, fast, call on God and pray until the Lord answers them. So let's pick up the story. After they've humbled themselves and worshiped God, they focused on God and worshiped God. Second Chronicles 20, starting at verse 15. Inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you king Jehoshaphat, the Lord says this to you, be not afraid or dismayed at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down to them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the ravine before the wilderness of Jeruel. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Take your position, stand still, and see the deliverance of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping him. Oh, this is so good so far. Let's skip over to verse 20. Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe and remain steadfast in his prophets, and you shall prosper. When he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers to sing to the Lord and praise him in their holy garments as they went out before the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. You get that? They're singing a song. Um, Give thanks to the Lord for his mercy endures forever. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushments against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were self-slaughtered. For suspecting betrayal, the men of Ammon and Moab rose against those of Mount Seir, utterly destroying them. And when they had made an end of the men of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. 
And when Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness, they looked at the multitude and behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth and none had it escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take the spoil, they found among them much cattle, goods, garments, and precious things, which they took for themselves more than they could carry away, so much that they were three days in gathering the spoil, the goods, the riches, the wealth. Okay, what did we just learn about real worship that gets results? Number one, humility is key to worship. Jehoshaphat and his people, they bowed before God, waiting on him. You see, humility in the Hebrew means gentleness, meekness, low, and has to do with two things, seeing and perceiving life and getting hooked to it, destroying the wall of self-protection, becoming vulnerable, self-protection is done away with. So, humility is key to worship. That's number one. Number two. Worship is key to results. How do we know Jehoshaphat and his people really truly worship? Well, they got God results. When you worship, God fights for you. When you worship God, you activate victory over your enemies and blessings over your life and family, over your home. Yes, even your living room. You activate blessings in your living room. Worship is key to results. That's number two. Number three, results confirm God's word. That's so important. What we just read was, when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushments against their enemies. Your enemy might be fear, depression, anxiety, sadness. Maybe it's poverty or physical sickness. The terrorist enemies in this story are pictures of what comes against you and your family in the spirit realm. God knows that results confirm his word in your life. He doesn't call you to a religious form of worship that has zero results for you and your family. God doesn't like futility. It gives him no pleasure. The people in the city of Jerusalem, they got results when they worshiped. Can you just imagine the conversation in the coffee shop the next morning in Jerusalem? Well, God said he'd fight our battles, and when we worshiped him, God did fight our battles for us, and we got all these rewards. Results confirm God's word, God's promises. A young woman got married. She and her husband had three children. It was her dream to have a family, a little home with a white picket fence and be a wife. One day, the perfect dream died, and her marriage suddenly fell apart. It actually just imploded. All alone with three little children, she felt like she couldn't, she couldn't go on anymore. She just felt like giving up. She was hopeless. One Sunday, she took her children to a church service and sat there numb, hopeless. An older man got up and he led this song that she'd never heard before. It went like this, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, yes, I know, he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. In her heart, she shouted, it's a lie. It's a lie. How can I go on? How can I face tomorrow? I can't breathe. How can I face tomorrow? But there was something in that older man's worship, something in the humility of his voice that welcomed the power of Almighty God into that woman's moment. She couldn't let go of the hope that she felt in that moment of worship. The song stuck in her head, in her heart. She began to turn to God's word, looking for promises to support that message. She read in John 3, 16 that God so loved her, so loved her and her children. She read in Philippians 4, verse 13, where it said that she could do all things through Christ who strengthens her. She also read in Psalm 68, verse 5, and this was so important to her, where it said that God would be a father to the fatherless. To her children. She told that one to her kids. She shared it with them. I know this story to be true. I know it to be true because I was one of those kids. That simple little song, it became one of my mom's favorites and she taught it to us kids. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone Because I know He holds
holds the future And life is worth the living Just because he lives What's your song of worship? What puts your fight over into God's capable hands? One, humility is key to worship. You have to submit to God's word, his promises, his way. Two, worship is key to results. You honor God when you expect outcome. That's faith. And then three, results confirm God's word. The world desperately needs you to experience God's outcomes, his results, because it confirms his word in your life. The goodness of God leads people to rethink, to return, to repent. Understand this, you getting results is not just about you. It's about those three kids watching to see if God is who he says he really is. It's about your neighbor who hears you singing along with Eloy and Stephanie and the worship team. They desperately need you to get results that God has for you because it'll give them hope. Results confirm God's word. This is why we worship. Start at the beginning, just like my mom did. Make Jesus your Lord and Savior. You need a Savior to praise. We all need the Savior. We need someone mighty to conquer the spiritual enemies without, but also the terrorist enemies within, like hopelessness, depression, fear, worry, anxiety, self-doubt, and on and on and on the list goes. Who do you praise for saving you from the curse, from sickness, from destruction and from evil, from brokenness? Let God Almighty be our true reason for why we worship. I'd like you to use your voice and pray this after me. I wanna hear your voice. Come on, pray out loud. Father God, I turn to you. Like that king in the Bible, I really need your help. The enemies are too much for me. Help me, God. Right now, I humble myself. I worship you. And I believe for results, an outcome that confirms your word. I acknowledge Jesus as my savior. He died on the cross, was raised from the grave, and now sits on the throne. He is Lord of my life. I give him all the praise for victory in my life. Yes, I've got the victory. Come on, say that again. I've got the victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with The Daily Prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.